Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of The Art of Possibility, a book by Benjamin Zander and Rosamund Stone Zander, Transforming Professional and Personal Life. This book, it's a how-to book, but it's a bit different. Unlike most how-to books that offer strategies to surmount the hurdles of a competitive world and get ahead, the objective of this book is to provide the reader, or in this case the listener, with a means to lift off from that world of struggle and sail into a vast universe of Ooh. possibility. Sounds like a pretty fun ride into that, <laughs> that vast sail of possibility. But the premise around this book, many circumstances in our life that really do block us are simply just a, a, based on the framework of assumptions that we carry with us everywhere. Um, and we're going to soon find out about drawing different lines. But if we draw a different frame around the same set of circumstances, all of a sudden new pathways pop up in a view. Mm. So the author is a bit of a husband-wife duo here. You've got Ben, who's the conductor of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra. And then you've got Roz, who is a, a like a private practitioner in terms of family therapy and psychology, who does group work. And it seems to me like Roz is kind of the brains behind it and Ben's just going off out into the world and, and trying to add a few fluffy stories to it. Just whacking a few <laughs> stories. It's a, so Ben, you know, he'll, he'll be conducting an orchestra and then someone will show up late and he'll yell at them and then he'll go home to his wife and say, oh, this is what happened today. And she'll say, come on, mate, you've done this all wrong. Yeah. Here's how you should do it instead. Yeah, and come, sort of, into the, come on the sailing <laughs> journey with me, Benny. <laughs> That's right. They'll say they're working together, but I think really Roz is doing a lot of the heavy lifting on this one. So the practice in this book, they're pretty simple. But a lot of things that are simple, a lot of the time, they're not actually easy to do. Like Ben, he remembers the cello lesson when he was 11 years old with his 83-year-old teacher, Herbert Withers. He tried to play a passage once and he couldn't get it right. He tried again. He flubbed it. He sucked. And he tried a third time. And he was very frustrated and he sort of just bowed his head down. And then Mr. Withers, he cheekily said, What, mate? You've been practicing for a minute and a half and you still can't play it? I think that's, I think that's a good gag from Mister Mister Withers. I think it's important just to show you know anything new that you try, whether it's trying to learn a new piece on the cello or whether it's in this case trying to step into the world of possibility. Obviously, the first time you do it, you're probably not going to get it perfect. The practices are going to take more than a minute and a half to get it right. You're going to flub it the first couple of times. You're going to stumble if you're Ben cursing out someone who's late to their volunteer orchestra practice, you're going to stuff it up a couple of times. So you need a bit of Roz to, to whip you back into line to help show you that, okay, whilst it's going to be hard to learn, eventually you'll get there. That gag didn't set the world on fire. I don't know how many times you convinced me that wasn't a very funny gag. But anyway, we'll move on to the next section. I think you need a cello lesson and then it, it might make sense. Have you sense. had a cello lesson? A uh, double bass lesson, okay. which is the same thing. cello on steroids. Same thing to the, un the person doesn't know what <laughs> neither really are. But here's a story for you, mate. You got a shoe factory and they send two of their marketing scouts to a region of Africa to study all the prospects of this new expanding business. And they've got different perspective. One sends back a telegram saying, situation hopeless. No one wears shoes. Let's not bother. The other one comes back and it says triumphantly, glorious business opportunity. They have no shoes. <laughs> There you go. To one marketing expert, they see no shoes and they think it's hopeless. The other sees the exact same condition and sees this uh, abundance and possibility. Each is sort of bringing their own perspective. The situation's exactly the same, but the framework through which we're looking at it is completely different. That's it. Exact same objective reality, but their mindset and the way they see the world is just entirely different. So the, the roots of this phenomenon go quite a bit deeper than just attitude and personality, all the way down through to neuroscience and a lot of research here to show that we roughly understand the world in a real specific sequence. Firstly, our senses bring us selective information about what's out there. Second, our brain sort of constructs its own simulation of those sensations. And then third, after we've kind of done all this stuff, that's when we have our sort of conscious experience of what we're saying is going on around us. So really what they're saying, it's kind of, it's all a story that we tell ourselves and you might say it's all invented. You could say it's all invented, Ash Joe. And it's a bit like you got a map of the world that's already drawn in your own brain, all of our individual brains. And the map, really, it's not a picture of the real world. One of the marketing executives, their map was somewhat of misery and no opportunity. And the other one map was just full of opportunity. So pretty much opposing maps of the exact same piece of world. So in both cases, pretty much every case we're all in, 
you're not going to have a map of the real world anyway. So, you're going to have something that's invented no matter what you do. Exactly. In dreams, we regularly weave in sensations gathered from things around us and morph it together into some coherent story. Have you ever had a dream like that where something's going on the outside and it pops into the dream? No. Oh, what do you I've, mean? I've got one, but I don't want to... It's so, an embarrassing one. I was, yeah. I'll say I was probably seven or eight. I was probably more like a 10 or 11, but I was. there was a fire. Oh. I remember... There was a fire. I had to go put out the fire. There was firemen fighting it. I went to help out. Oh, you pissed so the I bed? And, I went and pissed on the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woke up. I, I used to have that when I was young. Yeah, we all did. When I pissed the bed when I was young, same thing. <laughs> so, kind of obviously that we had something going on in the dream and then some way we merged the real world into the dream uh, to try to make it a coherent story. That's, that happens in dreams. And they're saying when you're fully awake though, you think, oh, we're not doing that. We're just seeing objective reality. But they're saying, no, the exact same things are happening. There's a few things going on objectively in the real world and we're just merging in our own sort of narrative into this. Now, if you're going to make shit up anyway, like you're not going to be hitting the nail on the head of what the real world is. You're going to have some sort of interpretation. So, if you're doing that anyway, why the hell don't you invent a story or a framework of meaning that actually enhances your quality of life and those around you? There's a bit of a test that they've got. It's probably better as a, as a visual there's nine dots, three Maybe rows YouTube, of three. If they can do a YouTube yeah. or <laughs> yeah, actually look at whatever. I don't know what you'd search for, nine dot box test or something. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there's nine dots, three rows of three. You can kind of visualize it. Your goal, you can't lift your pen off the paper. You've got to connect the nine dots with four lines. First time you think about it, no matter how you do it, there's always one dot missing. If you go from top left and you go down and then right and then up and then left, that's your four lines, but the one in the middle hasn't been crossed out. You know, know it. However you try to do it, you're not going to get it from just going within that box. So, if it's the first time you've ever done it, you're always going to try and do it within a box because it just you look at it, there's, there's eight dots in the box formation. So, you think box. Mm. That's what your brain says straight away. And to be honest, mate, I just told you before, I've read this chapter twice <laughs> in a long succession. I'd say the second time you've done it, you still can't do it properly, <laughs> if you may. Well, that's right. There is. You know, we all take those instructions. The instructions say, you know, without lifting your pen, do draw four lines. And we just assume that it's saying within the box, you know, within the, you know, the square that's formed by the outer dots. But that's something our brain invented. And within that framework, there's no possible solution. You can't do it. But if you said, you know, feel free to use the whole sheet of paper, which is another thing that's invented, you know, eventually you might think, oh, hang on, there's a way to do it here. And we can't explain it, but you've got to go outside the box to use those four lines to connect all nine dots. Well, as soon as this new instruction comes in, then all of a sudden everyone can just do it because... They see the box and then all sorts of new possibilities open up when they aren't confined to a, a map that they were previously using, which is really confining about the possibilities of what they had in their mind. That's right. And it wasn't there. Like, it wasn't objectively on the paper. They didn't say stay within the box. That was just in our brain. Our invented brain invented that. one of those ones. And so, it's saying, you know, you can't just make up anything. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I'm the, uh, you know, created this uh, company that takes a drop of blood and does all these diagnoses you know that doesn't work out properly uh you can't just make up anything but sometimes you, get, you can go back and question okay what are the assumptions that i've made up here and can i invent some other assumptions so every single problem every dilemma every time you find yourself in a dead end or anything facing your life there might be situations that, that appear insolvable but it really it is just a particular frame that you might have and have invented but really when you open and enlarge in the box and have a different uh, point of view, there's a new frame around the data and all of a sudden the problems that just seemed insurmountable previously, all of a sudden there's new opportunities popping up of how to solve these issues. So like that funny joke we had at the start about Mr. <laughs> Withers doing his practice, they're saying there's a practice you can do for this. You probably won't get it the first one or two or three times, but if you, if you keep practicing that cello or in this case practicing inventing stuff, you might get there eventually. Really the simple way to do this practice of it's all invented is to ask yourself the question, what assumptions am I making that I'm not aware I'm making that gives me what I see? Once you've kind of worked that out, you've worked out what all your assumptions are, the next question to ask yourself is, what might I now invent that I haven't yet invented that are going to give me other choices? Oh, banger. <laughs> Take that. So, once we've begun to distinguish that everything's invented, you got a map. So, at this point, we've got a map anyway. We mm. might as well just throw out the shitty map Give yourself a really good map because it's all invented anyway. Why have a bad restrictive map that just confines everything you can do? Once we realize that, we think, hey, what sort of map do we want? What, hmm. Where can we dwell where new inventions are the order of the day and new possibilities come in? Or as the title says, <laughs> or the art of possibility. 
I thought so would say um, <laughs> the universe of <laughs> yeah the sailing trip of possibility. <laughs> well, we've got most of us live in what they call the world of measurement. That's our current familiar everyday world. Everything we do is dictated by assessments and scales and standards and grades and comparisons. We all strive for success, and in this way, success means overcoming the same obstacles as everybody else, but doing it a little bit better. And in this world of measurement, the winning and the losing is all dependent on us beating other people or climbing some kind of arbitrary ladders set by society. So most of us choose this world of measurement really and it's, it really comes from when we're a child from the very start and then all the way through because you peer onto the lane next to you or they're already walking. Um, that's a month before the kids of my age. Well, maybe that's a parent saying that rather than the kids yeah. themselves. <laughs> or you know, we're comparing our company to others, whatever it might be. But life in this measurement world that we choose to live in a lot of the time, it's arranged by hierarchies like some groups or people or bodies, places, ideas, just seem better and more powerful to others. So just like uh, you know that metaphorical nine dots where we created a square or a box out of thin air, similarly in this world of measurement, virtually everybody's waking up in the morning with some kind of unseen uh, assumption, something that they've invented that's saying life, it's all about the struggle to survive and it's all about getting ahead of others with limited resources. The only way to win is to beat the person next to you. So instead of that map of measurement and constantly struggling for survival, we can actually really free ourselves from this and get rid of this generalized assumption of scarcity about the world and think about what happens if we go on this little sailing trip with our friends Rosa and Benny and sailed off into the sunset of the universe of possibility instead and it really lived with the posture of openness and with an unfettered imagination of what can actually be. If you think about thinking outside the box and once you realize you can start squiggling outside the paper, what are the possibilities that could start being pumped into your life? That's it. Chuck out that atlas of the world of measurement and now we're What's the equivalent for a universe? Something that there is none. There's more than a. There's a sailor boat. <laughs> the sailor boat, the universe of possibility. In this realm of possibility, we gain our knowledge by invention, by creation, uh, new opportunities, new possibilities. Instead of in that old world where we're competing and winning, the actions here are more about generating new possibilities, giving in all senses of the world, producing new life, creating new ideas, consciously endowing with meaning, contributing. All these things come in the universe of possibility. When things seem that there's no possibility, you might be angry and blocked and all your efforts and others and no one's wanting to cooperating with you. No one wants to compromise or find some sort of halfway point. Even when the shit hits the fan, you think there's nothing you can do, you can always do this next practice in this graduate course in possibility. Imagine a scenario. A car waits peacefully at a red light. Another barrels up behind it and rear ends it, smashes into it. The driver in that second car, it turns out they were intoxicated and unlicensed. They were a little 14-year-old kid that had stolen a bottle of vodka and stolen the car keys and gone and smashed you up. Who's at fault here? Obviously, according to law, there's no doubt the drunk, unlicensed driver, they're 100% at fault. I think that's salt and pepper, the 14-year-old created <laughs> up a bit because you'd say it's the parents. Oh, it, uh, yeah, true. But say it's a 22-year-old, right? Or yeah. the kid as well. You blame the kid, the oh, shitty yeah. little kid. Yeah, they're but, 100% at fault. They're 100% at fault. Oh, we'll go with that. But, <laughs> but. There's a big but. But at the end of the day, you'd be blaming entirely on that person. But in this chapter, we're going to look at a new possibility and that's the notion of responsibility of a different kind and it's a different kind which you can take i probably wouldn't want to take it in that situation ash show but maybe you can because in this new one you can't assign it to someone else uh it's purely an invention and it really strengthens you at no one else's expense this choice that's right normally the blame and blamelessness of saying that person who stole a car and was drunk and unlicensed you know and blame them it's all their fault that's the old school that's the world of measurement you know we blame someone for something that goes wrong, we seek to establish that we're right. It's a bit of competition. I win, you lose. But of course, as much as we sort of blame other people in this world of measurement, in the universe of possibility, we can take a bolder responsibility to saying everything that happens is kind of up to us. Because if you don't take responsibility for things, you really lose all the leverage you might have had because there's nothing you can do about someone mm. else's mistakes, really. You can only do stuff about your own mistakes. So whatever might happen... You know, you, you lose your job or whatever it might be. You might blame it on someone else or the economy or whatever reason. But as soon as you say, look, I could probably could have worked harder mm. and I made a mistake, you can only do something about what you've done, not what other things have done to you. 
if we go back to this driver, she's lying on a hospital bed because she got smashed up by the drunk driver. A different way of looking at it is saying, okay, well, driving's a hazardous business. Every time you step into the car, you're taking a risk, and that's taking a fair bit of responsibility. You know, she's saying, well, I can count on other drivers to be awake, to be aware, to be law abiding. There's always a chance somewhere that someone's going to fall asleep at the wheel or drink too much or have a heart attack at the wheel and run off the road or someone just being young or angry or reckless or whatever's going on. So taking that responsibility is saying that, okay, well, if I'm going to drive, I'm taking a statistical risk. So I, I kind of got to cop it. I kind of, kind of got to own everything that happens on the road. Yeah, that's a pretty cool way of looking at it, isn't it? Every time you do anything, there's a statistical risk. Like if you go mountain climbing or whatever and you fall and you break your leg, you can't really be angry. You can't blame the mountain, can you? You can't blame the mountain. I made the call. It's probably more of an explicit choice, that one. (laughs) It happens really in any situation. So in this practice, we're going to be declaring that I am the framework for everything that happens in my life. Or another way of saying it, if I cannot be present without resistance to the way things are and act effectively, if I feel myself to be wronged, a loser or a victim, I'll tell myself that some assumption I've made is the source of my difficulty. To use a bit of a metaphor here, we might look at the game of chess to describe life and take this sort of approach to responsibility. Normally, if you're going to ask someone, hey, you got the chessboard here with all the pieces, can you identify yourself with some aspect of the game? Some people might be saying, oh, yeah, I'm a humble pawn who's not doing much. I'm the knight who can sneak around corners or I'm the important king where everything matters or I'm the queen who can kind of do anything possible. If you're kind of identifying yourself with one of the pieces, you're probably stuck back in that world of measurement of trying to conquer the enemy. Some smart ass might say, oh, I'm the mastermind, I'm the chess player, the strategist behind the scenes who's controlling everything on the field. But again, you're kind of stuck in that world of measurement. In this practice, however, we're defining ourselves not as a piece or a strategist or even one of the players, but we're defining ourselves as the board itself. And that's the framework for the game of life to just unfold around you. The purpose of identifying ourselves as the board on which everything happens, it's kind of setting the context for which life is uh, occurring around you. Things are going to happen on your board, but you've got a lot more power to transform your experiences of anything that's popping onto that board. So you make, on this board, you make room for all the moves. So it might be the capture of the knight or sacrificing the bishop. You're not really playing a game white against black. You're just living because really that's all is there and it's the way the things are and you're being quite more neutral about it. So then the second part, once we've kind of identified that in this this game of life where the board on which everything happens, when things pop up, unexpected or unwanted circumstances, you get fired from your job, your house gets flooded, uh, you get hit by a drunk driver, that's when you can say, well, how did this thing get onto my board? You know, you it's it's not saying, oh, poor me, I was the, I was the pawn and someone just come and knocked me off the board. You're saying, you're the board, something's happened on your board. How on earth did this thing happen on your board? Because it is your board. It could be an example here that you throw out all your good ideas to your boss and you start, as you speak, and you just see a blank stare and you're realizing he's never, he never listens to me. He's competitive with me. He just wants to be right. He's not listening to me. And again, you're probably playing like a bishop there. Mm, big time. If you're going the board approach, And you're thinking, okay, how did this get onto my board that my boss isn't listening to me? And soon you'll notice that this idea of sort of not being listened to has become a bit of an abstraction of you with all these meaning attached like, you know, he doesn't want to listen to me or he's competitive or he's closed-minded or I'm not confident enough in my speech. And there's all, all of a sudden, it's not just this one person that you're competing against. All of a sudden, there's all these different situations that arise that you have a lot more control over. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because like, think about the, the driving example. You'd say, how did it get on this board that this person rear-ended me? Mm. If you look at it from that perspective, you go, oh, I drove to work. Am I not going to drive to work? I'm going to drive to work. Because of that, there's a statistical possibility that someone hit me. So pretty much anything like that happens. At the end of the day, you can just bring it back to where you had the power of the choice. Mm. And due to statistics, in the law of statistics, some things are going to happen in that realm and, and you choose really the path that you go on. Yeah, if you think about the boss, there's a few different possibilities here. Rather than just saying, oh, my boss is an idiot, they never listen to me, you could think, well, maybe I need to have a bit more conviction in what I say, maybe I need to be more confident, or maybe you might think, oh, my boss, he didn't take this advice because he wasn't enrolled in it. It's kind of up to me to not just tell him the facts, but tell him the story behind it, help him get to those conclusions, a sort of lighter path along the way. So it's kind of up to me to influence his thinking as well. So I think just being the board and realizing that it's not a competitive world, that things are happening, you've got a lot more control than you think, 
a lot of invented assumptions. I think it's a much better approach to, to tackle life with. Strolling along the edge of a sea, a man saw a young young lady and she was doing something weird in a ritual dance. She stooped down and straightened to her full height and cast her arm out in an arc. Coming to be closer, she was just grabbing starfish and then throwing them back one by one into the sea. He's shaking his head at this stage thinking, you're an idiot. <laughs> like there are basically there's so many starfish as far as the eyes can see, miles up the beach. What difference is making one of them? You know, why are you throwing this? Look at look at them all that are out there. Yeah, you're saying, you know, how can you pot? You know, saving a couple of starfish. What difference is that possibly going to make? She bent down once more, tossed another one back in the water, and said, "Well, it's certainly going to make a difference to this one." From our earliest days, we understand that there's tasks ahead of us to accomplish and big landmarks to achieve. Looks a bit like an obstacle course of all the things that you need to do and in order to maximize success, you need to find a way around this obstacle course to get through what's in front of you. The bloke in that story, he just saw an obstacle where there was just countless starfish. The obstacle was that, well, there's no possible way to save all the starfish, so I'm not going to bother. He said to the young woman, you know, it's futile, there's too many starfish, not enough time, not enough resources. Uh, the results are too difficult to track, so don't even bother trying. So in the world of him, he's probably just judging this lady who's having a crack and being in the moment. But what she's doing, she's really smiling and serene and um, she's moving in a pattern of dance. And for her, absent of the familiar measurements of progress, instead, life is revealed as a place that contributors contributors. Um, not because she's measuring the amount of good, saying I'm 3% through the Starfish Express, getting them out, but she's just doing good for the sake of it in that moment. It's all about being a contribution. Even if you can't save all the starfish, at least it contributes something to at least a small handful of it. When we play this contribution game, it's never really a single individual who's transformed. The transformation overrides all these different divisions and all these different uh, competitive measurement things that we're doing. And really, it opens the door for you to transform yourself, for you to help contribute to others, and they might even help contribute to others outside of them as well. So stepping out of the world of measurement full of competition and comparison and step into the universe of possibility or sail away into the universe of possibility, Ash Joe. Now, it's a choice for a completely different outlook on life and it's a choice that you can make right now. 